It was Thomas Edison who once said, if we did all the things we are capable of doing, we would truly astound ourselves. I wholeheartedly believe this statement and believe that each young person should aim high as they are capable of reaching goals they may not believe are even attainable. Every individual can achieve to heights beyond their wildest dreams. If I wanted to learn how to ski, although I've never skied in my life and the thought of it is extremely daunting, I could very well one day be gliding down the Alps, if I put in the hard work of course. If I wanted to learn another language, I could, even though the thought of me speaking fluent Spanish is inconceivable at this moment in time, it could one day become possible. Or if I wanted to become a mechanic, a vet or even a lawyer, I could. It won't be easy, hard work is required and there are hurdles I would need to overcome, but there are absolutely no boundaries in education. Hence every individual can achieve. Learners simply need to envision and plan how they are to reach their goals, believe in themselves and their potential and have confidence that learning a new subject, a new skill, a new anything is possible with motivation and hard work. This is why I aim to teach to the best of my ability, creatively, innovatively, all in order to inspire the young minds of the next generation. This involves the use of ICT and modern technology, staying in touch with the younger generation and using these resources to your advantage. This means being creative and fun in the classroom, with activities for your lesson planning and preparation. This means adhering to the various learning styles that learners may have, ensuring that differentiation and inclusion is always addressed. Equality, diversity and safeguarding is extremely important, ensuring that every learner feels safe, comfortable and ready to learn in the classroom. And behaviour management is something that is more than prevalent in teaching. For me, consistency is the key and being firm but fair. A sense of encouragement, a simple smile and listening all go a long way to help convey a positive message and promote learning. Teaching and learning is complex, ambiguous and is a never-ending hierarchy of questions, debate and there are many areas of inquiry one can enter when joining the profession. Therefore, it is important that one is actually able to manage time appropriately, balancing a personal life whilst improving as a teacher, putting your profession first in many cases outside of the classroom and taking a certain amount of responsibility for the learning of your students. And if I ever get lost or confused in the world of teaching, I always come back to the first duty as a teacher, to promote learning and to engage the student in the learning process. I aim to adhere to all of these things through a commitment to continual reflection, adaptation and improvement, all in response to the ever-changing demands of the teaching profession. Before starting my PGCE, I had no idea about what kind of teacher I was about to become. As someone who is completely new to teaching, with no prior experience, my strength initially lied within my subject specialism, philosophy, and my passion to promote it. Philosophy is a subject which is very much overlooked in post-compulsory education, and is only available in a very few selected schools and colleges. Therefore, the decision was made for me to teach religious studies, in which many of the components are philosophy based. Religious studies is a unique subject in that it demands each learner to think about their own personal values and beliefs. Each learner is encouraged to confront certain philosophical questions. For key stages 4 and 5, this includes touching upon ethical and controversial issues such as abortion, euthanasia and the existence of God. Therefore the subject can be challenging and teaching it requires different approaches. What helps me choose activities is adhering to the different learning styles that exist. Common learning styles used in the classroom are visual, auditory and kinesthetic. What Paul Guinness argues in his book, The Teacher's Toolkit, is that some learners are more comfortable and retain more information with one style rather than another. The sensible approach to tackle this is to incorporate all three methods into teaching. Although there is debate around whether learning styles even exist, I feel as though there is a general consensus about what effective teaching is, that it involves using a variety of methods to cater for different learners' needs and ensures that individuals are motivated and challenged. Therefore, in my lessons, I ensure that all learning styles are addressed, either in one lesson if possible or over a period of lessons. After teaching for the first few weeks on my placement, I definitely feel as though I've developed my own style of teaching. I have encountered problems but have overcome them. 
My very first lesson teaching was with a Year 13 A-level class. I scrutinously prepared my lesson, had a range of activities planned, and meticulously rehearsed how I was to conduct the lesson. It paid off as the lesson went extremely well. The learners were engaged, they enjoyed the activities, and the lesson objectives were met. This was the first time I'd ever taught in a classroom, and it felt as though my teaching persona was finally born. The next day I taught a Year 7 RE class. Again, I planned and prepared, more confident now that I had a taste for teaching. However, things could not have been more different. The lesson was challenging, there were constant low-level behavioural problems, and the school's network server went down just before I started the lesson, meaning I had to teach from memory. It was all a huge learning curve for me. Controlling the class presented many problems. Although I had enforced ground rules from the start, low-level behaviour was prevalent throughout the whole lesson. Other problems also came to the surface, i.e. some learners were struggling to write basic sentences, whereas others were much more fluent in their writing. Some children would finish their tasks quickly, whereas others would take much longer. Therefore, differentiation suddenly became very real, and I have learned to implement more stretch and challenge activities in future lessons to prevent children from sitting at their desks doing nothing. The lesson was not all doom and gloom. There were plenty of positives. At times the children were listening and very much engaged. There were times I had full control of the classroom, and the reason I believe I lost control at times was because I was not fully prepared for challenging behaviour. After the lesson, many of my fellow teachers gave me plenty of ideas on how to manage low-level behaviour. For example, a countdown system works much better than demanding silence at the top of your lungs. And I was advised to implement a behaviour reward and punishment system, in which learners can either win prizes or gain detention. So I went out and bought prizes for the children, and designed a reward and punishment system. I implemented this system along with all the advice I'd been given in the next lesson and it worked. I had much more control of the classroom. It did still feel as though half of my time was spent on managing behaviour rather than teaching. However, I hope to reduce this significantly in time. What's interesting is that before I started teaching, I hoped I would never conform to behaviourism as there is plenty written on its diminishing effects. Paul Guinness states, assertiveness is rooted in the teacher's belief that students can change their behaviour. It does not depend on the ultimately diminishing effects of behaviourism. He talks of how managing behaviour with punishment and reward is merely a temporary fix, and long-term change can only occur once the learner recognises and self-reflects on the implications of bad behaviour. I agree with this humanistic approach to some extent, but even Guinness succumbs to a certain amount of behaviourism in that if learners continually misbehave, after assertive instruction, he then advises to follow through with school policy, i.e. detention, removal of a student from a classroom, etc. My feeling is, especially with younger children, if reward and punishment gets them to listen and learn, then it is definitely worth implementing. With a positive attitude, combined with an innate sense of assertiveness, I hope to tackle bad behaviour and promote learning as best as I can. The term professional to me simply means acting sensibly, maturely, showing respect to others and taking your job seriously. And this cannot apply more when it comes to entering a school, working with other teachers and teaching children. At the school I am teaching, the dress code for men is strictly trousers, shoes and shirt. Although I tend to also wear a tie and blazer, as this looks even smarter. I do not wear unnecessary jewellery and I cover my tattoos as I am trying to exert myself as a professional. Professionalism also means having integrity and conducting yourself in a certain manner, especially when you are always in the presence of children. It is vital that you are setting a good example, i.e. always treating children and staff with respect. Not only when teaching, but generally I always ensure I am speaking very clearly with a certain grace and dignity. And when speaking to children authoritatively, it is important to use judgement in when to do so, and use common sense and initiative in handling situations of misbehaviour. Sometimes in school, decisions have to be made very quickly. Therefore, being confident, assertive and assisting other teachers is all commonplace in the school environment. There is certainly no time to be nervous or lacking confidence. I have also noticed that many members of staff can sometimes become very busy, including my mentor. They'll have classes to teach, lessons to plan at short notice, 
and will be entering and exiting the staff room at high speed throughout the day. It is important to recognise that this is not ignorant behaviour. It is simply the life of a teacher and there may be times when a teacher may not be able to help or assist you. Fortunately, I have had much support from members of staff, ready to offer advice and help when there has been an opportunity to do so. Also, other trainees from other universities all have been offering guidance and support. The head of department checks on me regularly to see how I am progressing. Therefore, I do generally feel as though I have a network of support. As a member of staff, I have to abide by a number of rules and responsibilities. First and foremost is attendance and punctuality. I am expected to arrive at school each day for 8.30am, even if I am not teaching or observing until later on. It is school policy, but also I can catch up with my mentor this way before she teaches herself. Any time that I am not teaching or observing is spent on studying or lesson planning. There are extracurricular activities that I am involved in. This includes a meeting once a week with fellow trainee teachers. The session is usually for an hour and each week the focus is on a different topic, such as assessment, safeguarding or ICT. Different departments adhere to different rules, therefore it is interesting to see and learn from trainees working in different departments. Overall, my teaching experience so far has been incredible. There have been challenges, obstacles I have had to overcome. I certainly feel as though I am now a teacher and have a very good understanding of the profession its roles and responsibilities. I'm still developing my own teaching philosophy and persona and think I always will be, so I very much hope to continue learning, continue improving and become the best teacher I can be.